How do I baptize men in the Holy Spirit? There are four ways of getting people baptized in the Holy Spirit from Scripture. Whichever works for you best, apply it until you begin to master others. Praise God. The first way to get people baptized in the Holy Spirit is to tell them to ask in faith. When you ask in faith, you receive. In John 7, verse 7 to 9, there are lots of scriptures. Luke 11, verse 13, Matthew 7, 7 to 9. You see all of this. He said, ask, you will receive. Seek, you will find. Knock, the door shall be opened unto you. He said, for whoever asketh, receiveth. Whoever seeketh, findeth. Whoever knocketh, the door is opened unto him. And he went further. He said, as wicked as your earthly parents are, will you ask them for bread and they give you stone or for fish and they give you serpent? He said, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And so when you win souls, sometimes before you even begin to advance, tell them to ask God to baptize them. As they're asking the Lord to fill them with the Holy Spirit, even before you ever prayed, some of them will be baptized. Because it's not everybody that will be baptized by laying, of your, laying on of your hands. The reason is because there are blockages. They have taught some people from their church, only your pastor should lay hands on you. So they believe your gospel until you try to lay hands on them. They'll say, no, no, no. Ah. So in order not to enter into doctrinal dispute, ask all of them first to ask God to baptize them. God will honor it as much as he will honor any other method. Because if you meet a man who has a theology that only his pastor can lay hands on him, he will enter into a controversy with you. If you meet a man who believes that not everybody should put touch hand on their head, it will be pro Somebody came to me one day and said, he wants me to lay my hands on him. And he was talking slowly with a heavy voice. He said, he doesn't allow people to touch his head. Not... He doesn't allow everybody to lay hands on him. But he is led to come to me to lay hands. That means it's an honor for me to lay hands. <laughs> when I looked at him, I say, Amen. Let me help you fit so that you go. I don't have argument. I say, Receive. And I turn back. You don't know what people will carry in their head. So, in order not to start any argument, you want to help them. That's your priority. So, the first way to get people baptized in the Holy Spirit is to tell them to ask the Father in faith. Because now they are born again. So they are entitled to it. And the reason that works is because they are not asking God to release the Holy Ghost from heaven. That would never have worked. They are able to ask God now for the Holy Spirit because he has already been given. We are not the one that prayed the Holy Ghost down. It was Jesus that prayed the Holy Ghost down. In John 14, 26, he said, I am ascending to heaven and I will pray the Father that he may release the Comforter. So it was Jesus that prayed the Holy Spirit. And so everyone who is born again already has access to receive the Holy Ghost because he has already been given. So you're asking the Father now is to take what is already available. So any child of God can receive the Holy Spirit by asking in faith. So you tell them to ask in faith, some will be baptized, but some will not be baptized. And so you go to the second level. The second way of baptizing people in the Holy Spirit is by laying hands on them. In Acts 19, from verse 2 to verse 6, the Bible said, Paul passed through Ephesus and he saw some believers there. And Paul knew that it's not enough to confess Jesus. He said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, we have not as much as heard of any Holy Spirit. We have only heard of the baptism of John. And the Bible said that Paul explained to them. This is what makes the baptism of, baptism of the Holy Ghost very effective. And I'll talk about it very briefly since I'm talking about this now. There are many misconceptions people have in their minds that makes it impossible for them to receive the Holy Spirit. So most times before you lay hands on people, it's important to explain to them what will happen to them. There are some people that believe that until the energy of God come on them and they fall down and they lose consciousness and they don't know where they are again, then their mouth will start shaking on its own. 
It's when their mouth starts shaking that they will start speaking in tongues. No. The Bible says Paul explained to them. And he said when it was done, he said he laid hands on them. He said they received the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So the second way to receive the Holy Spirit is by laying hands on them. And so you need to know that there is power in your hands. That's why Paul said in 1 Timothy 2 verse 1 that we should lift up holy hands. There is something in your hand. Your hand is not ordinary. When you lay hands on people, the Spirit of God is released. That's why when you lay hands on your business, it must work. It says, whatsoever he doeth, it shall prosper. Because there is something here. And one of the ways to use it is to use it to give the Holy Spirit to those who believe. The third way to get men baptized in the Holy Spirit is by bringing them to the company of the believers. In Acts 10, 44, we saw that Peter was invited to Cornelius' house and as they came in, while he was yet speaking, the Bible said the Holy Ghost fell on them. You saw the testimony we had from Obolo. A woman that gave her heart to Christ in the 70s have never spoken in tongues. But when she came for that crusade and God began to touch people, she was baptized in the Holy Spirit and she spoke in tongues for the first time in over 40 years. So when people come to the assembly of the brethren, many things happen to them. One of it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You saw what happened here the other time. A boy, was, a young man was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He spoke in tongues. He couldn't help himself. And he was so offended. How can a strong man like him fall down? If you wanted to lay hands on that guy, you will, you will be in problem. Because he already believes that pastors push people to fall. So as you are bringing your hand, instead of receiving, he's trying to put his leg where? I will not fall today. This thing that they do today, not today. We will see today. And then he did. <laughs> While he's doing that, he doesn't receive. And then he goes out and says, I know they are fake now. Because the mind was already corrupt. That's why you bring them. When they come into the company of the, of the believers like this, God can fall upon them. In Acts chapter 2 verse 1, he said they were together in one accord. Well, that was where the Holy Ghost fell on them. And he said, cloven tongues as of fire was on their heads and they spoke in tongues. Praise God. So, if you tell them to receive the Holy Spirit, or you lay hands on them, or you bring them to the company of the believers, and finally, which is what happens to a lot of people who defy this first tree, because there are lots of people that this tree, you have applied it, no one worked. One of my friends here, before I baptized him in the Holy Spirit, we were talking today humorously and we were laughing. I followed this young man up for more than two years. When I come and talk, he will say, wait, how about this scripture? That day, we will use the whole of that day and argue on that scripture. When we finish, I will come again the next day. He will say, wait, how about this scripture? We were moving back and forth. The second year, I had to take him to church. When he came there, I said, well, he would have believed, but they spoke about money. When I couldn't, everything I knew, I applied it, it didn't work. I went and got a book by Kenny Hagin turned beyond the upper room and I gave him. When he read it, all the arguments in his head that I didn't have skill to gather, Kenny Hagin gathered all of them there. So if he's reading, before he asks the next question, the book is answering it. Before he asks. So when they dealt with everything, he now came and said, now he's ready. So there are people that you would try one, two, three, it won't work. So what you need to do is give them the word of God. Let them go and battle it out with the word. So they first play. This is the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is not primarily being on the camera. Or No, those are good. This is a, disciple, a training ground. Without those ones, we can still function. Our impact will only be reduced. Media amplifies what we do, so we take advantage of it. But the main work of the ministry is for everybody to begin to do all of these things I've outlined. If you stay on one person for seven months, you will know that you can't keep malice. You will know you can't gossip. You will know you will understand what it means to win one soul. The reason 
People fight easily in church is because we are strangers. All of us met ourselves by different reasons. If the church begins to grow organically, love will be precipitated naturally. Imagine if we are seven here and seven of us won all the souls that are here. And it's not just like we won everybody. We won one, the other person won another one. Somewhere, somehow, there will be a connection between all of us. So if I talk against somebody that you won, you will say, no, it's not like that. And if you talk against somebody I won, I will say, no, it's not like that. Somewhere, somehow, the gossip will die. Because we are all interconnected. One person won one, the other won the other one. So there is a circuit that binds us together. But when it just comes about, I'm popular on the internet and people come and gather, everybody will be strangers. So you have no connection. You didn't labor over him in prayer. You can talk against him. If you labor over somebody in evangelism and soul winning, if he falls, you will go back to what you did to bring him into the kingdom. Paul said, my little children, of whom I travel again. That means he has traveled before. I travel again in prayers until Christ be formed in you. If church will grow and grow organically, the principles of evangelism must be established. And so when you win souls, you baptize them in the Holy Spirit. When somebody is baptized in the Holy Spirit, the evidence of that Holy Spirit baptism is not speaking in tongues. I need to explain this as I round up because I want to talk about four misconception of speaking in tongues just to help somebody's understanding and then we are done. When people are baptized in the Holy Spirit a large number of them speak in tongues immediately some speak in tongues after. It's not everybody who is baptized in the Holy Ghost that speaks in tongues immediately. When Paul was baptized in the Holy Spirit there was no record that he spoke in tongues. The Bible said something that looked like a scale of fish fell off his eyes. Are you with me? But much later, in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 18, Paul said, I speak in tongues more than all of you. So if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, are you supposed to speak in tongues? Yes. Should you speak in tongues? Yes. But the proof that you are baptized in the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. However, if you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you will speak in tongues. The proof that you are baptized in the Holy Ghost is power. You can speak in tongues and be powerless. Why am I saying this? Because power begins with consciousness. I'm going to talk about misconception around tongues. And I will, I will show you that everybody who is baptized in the Holy Ghost should speak in tongues. But I want you to know foundationally, two times when Jesus spoke about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it was power he mentioned. Tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. That's Luke 24, 49. Acts 1, 8. Not many days from now, you shall receive the Holy Ghost and power. And then if you go to Acts chapter 4, when they prayed, and the Bible said in verse 30 and 31 that the, the place where they were was shaking and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the next thing he said was power. He said with great power in verse 33, Acts 4, 33, he gave witness of the resurrection of the dead. Great grace was upon them. So everybody who is baptized in the Holy Spirit need to know that from that day, he has become a carrier of power. The intensity of that power can grow with prayer. It can grow with fasting. It can grow with revelation. But the seed of power is the proof that a man has been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So as you are baptizing people with the Holy Spirit, you need to understand that what you are introducing them into is power. If you don't know that, your consciousness will rob you of what God has to offer. So having understood that, the second thing that everybody who is baptized in the Holy Ghost should have is speaking in tongues. However, not many believers are speaking in tongues. The question is why? Most times the reason people don't receive what God has to offer is because of misunderstanding. The Bible said you made the word of God of none effect by your traditions. So we misunderstand things and we build a tradition around it and those traditions become a stronghold that limits people from growing or receiving what God has to offer. There are four misunderstandings that if trashed out makes receiving the Holy Ghost become effortless and fluid. 
I'm going to explain this so that when you lay hands on somebody and he doesn't receive the Holy Ghost, you tell him to ask God he doesn't receive the Holy Ghost. Before you put more energy, come back and trash this misconception and try again. You will be amazed that the percentage will begin to grow rapidly the moment they understand. Because faith comes naturally by understanding. The moment a man understands, faith is born. People don't have faith when they don't understand. The moment they understand, faith is born. So the problem people have is not a faith problem. It's an understanding problem. And so when you are struggling to baptize somebody in the Holy Ghost and it's not working, many times these misconceptions are the problem. I outline them quickly as we round up. The first misconception is not everybody should speak in tongues. Not everybody. That's what many people, that's the argument of many people. But that's not the position of scripture. In Acts chapter 2 from verse 1, the Bible said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, it said they were together in one accord, and he said, suddenly they heard the sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And he said, the place where they are was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, cloven tongues as of fire appeared on their head. And he said, they all spake in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So everyone that was baptized at the first spoke in tongues. So why should you and I not speak in tongues? If that exemption existed, it would have had a foundation. There's something we call principle of first mention in biblical interpretation. And so when you want to find out a reality, you go to the scripture and find out the first time it happened, how did it happen? That becomes a pattern for subsequent occurrence. The first set of believers that received the Holy Ghost all speak in tongues. And so every other believer who received the Holy Ghost should speak in tongues. The second misconception people have that supports this one is what I just explained earlier. They said even Paul, they are didn't speak in tongues. That is true. The Bible did not record that Paul did not speak in tongues when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. But later, we heard the record of Paul. In 1 Corinthians 14, 18, Paul said, I speak in tongues more than all of you. So Paul may not have spoken in tongues the day he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, which we are not sure of. The Bible didn't mention it. That the Bible didn't mention it does not mean he didn't speak in tongues. So the Bible didn't tell us that Paul didn't speak in tongues. It was just not mentioned. But we saw much later that Paul spoke in tongues more than the whole church. And so if you cannot find a believer who didn't speak in tongues, then it will be an error for you not to speak in tongues. In Acts 10.44, when the Holy Ghost fell in Cornelius' house, Every one of them that was there spoke in tongues. And Peter, when he was reporting, said it happened to them the same way it happened to us at the first. So the argument that everybody should not speak in tongues is what has kept many people refusing to receive the Holy Spirit because they feel that they are in the category of the few that shouldn't speak in tongues. It's not so. A lot of people have even taught this, that it's not a must to speak in tongues, you shouldn't speak in tongues. If you study the scripture and you understand the benefit of praying in the Holy Spirit, you will discover that every believer who is not speaking in tongues is doing his or herself a great disfavor. The second misconception around speaking in tongues is this. You speak in tongues when you are overwhelmed. That means you shouldn't speak in tongues. You can't just stand up and start doing what kind of thing is that? For you to speak in tongues, you should be overwhelmed. So in your subconscious state, you can begin to speak in tongues. But the first disciples that spoke in tongues, the Bible didn't say they were overwhelmed. They were actually speaking in tongues in Acts chapter 2 from verse 1. And when the people said they were drunk, they stopped. And Peter began to preach. That means they had full control of themselves. The Bible said the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So the people were not overwhelmed. The moment they said these are drunk people, the Bible said Peter stood up with the eleven. Immediately, everybody kept quiet. And Peter started preaching and won 3,000 souls. 
So what they were doing, they were not out of control. They had full control of what they were doing. The reason many people don't speak in tongues is because when you lay hands on them to baptize them in the Holy Spirit, they are waiting for to fall down. And when they are overwhelmed, then they can start speaking in tongues. That's why they never speak in tongues because not everybody is overwhelmed with the anointing. There are people whose response to the anointing is to be overwhelmed. There are other people who become silent. The Bible said, be still and know. So when the Holy Ghost comes on some people, they become still. There are people that when the Holy Ghost comes upon them, they start laughing. There are people that when the Holy Ghost comes upon them, they start receiving instructions. Outright instruction on what to do. In fact, they need to get a pen quickly and start writing. They are highly under the anointing at that time. So it's not everybody that falls down. And if you are going out and you don't tell them that, please don't wait to be overwhelmed. They will never speak in tongues even though they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because they don't know. And so they will not speak in tongues. So the second misconception is the fact that people believe that if they are not overwhelmed, they can't speak in tongues. Some even speak in tongues. And then later when they go out and they see people overwhelmed, they now say, Kai, that tongue they were speaking is fake. They now dump the tongue and go and start looking for the real tongue. Have you not seen that before? They say, no, no, that tongue they receive is not the original. It's fake. No, it's not like that. It's actually an authentic tongue. You have that ability because you are born again. The third misconception around speaking in tongues is the fact that there are people who believe that you can't speak in tongues except as you understand. And what they tell you is that when they spoke in tongues in Acts chapter 2, people heard them and they understood their language. What kind of tongue are you people speaking now? That is, which language is that? <laughs> in Acts chapter 14 verse 2, Paul explained, because there is praying in tongues or praying in the spirit. There is speaking in tongues and then there is speaking in diverse kinds of tongues. And I explained that. Praying in tongues is a mystery. It's you talking to God. And in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2, Paul said, when we speak in an unknown tongues, talking in the context of prayer, he said, no man understands us. No man, including yourself, he said, how be it in the spirit he uttereth mysteries. So when a man is praying in tongues, he's not talking to men, he's talking to God. So no man understands him. In 1 Corinthians 14 verse 14, he said, when I pray in the spirit, my understanding is unfruitful. That means even me who is praying, I don't understand. So when he said no man, he's not talking about other men, he's talking about the one praying himself. So it's an act of faith. You don't have to understand to pray in tongues because you are talking to God in the God language. It's a code in the spirit. Now, talking in tongues is different from praying in tongues. Talking in tongues is a prophetic message that is encoded. That is what requires interpretation. So when you are talking in tongues and there is no interpretation, you stop. It's a waste. Because that is not you talking to God. That is you talking to the body in a coded language. And so for the body to understand it, there has to be an interpretation. That's why Paul said when we speak in tongues, he said, and there is interpretation, then it's equivalent to prophecy because now it can profit the church. That is a message from God to the church. So when you go out to baptize somebody in the Holy Spirit, he's not bringing a message to the body of Christ. So he doesn't need an interpretation. He's actually talking to God in a mystery. And God understands him. No man understands him. Speaking in diverse kinds of tongues, on the other hand, is you delivering a message in a language that is not your own, but you got to speak it supernaturally. Either because God wants to give a sign to an unbeliever, or because God wants to speak to somebody there in his language. So there are three different operations. When we win souls, what we are doing is not the second or the third. The second is a message to the church. The third is a message to individuals. The first is conversation with God. And because it's a conversation between you and God, no man knows it, including yourself. If you don't explain this to them, they will be full of the Holy Spirit, but they will not say a word. They will be waiting to, in, to know what they want to say before they say it. So what they are hearing in their head is, Kalaka. Kalaka. And as far 
they are concerned, they don't understand it. And because they don't understand it, they will never say it. If you like, pour water on them. Gather 12 intercessors. When you pray hard, he will sit down and say he's tired, he wants to rest. He was already baptized in the Holy Spirit, but he never said it because it doesn't make sense to him. You need to let him know that it doesn't have to make sense to him. The final misconception, which is the worst one, is the fact that they say when the church was baptized, the Holy Ghost was the one speaking through them. That's not what the Bible taught. In Acts chapter 2 verse 4, the Bible said, they speak as God gave them utterance. They were the ones speaking. So if somebody is baptized in the Holy Spirit, if he doesn't open his mouth to speak, no matter what you do, he will never speak in tongues. You need to let him know that he is the one who will open his mouth to speak what God is putting in his mind. Now you have already established that it doesn't have to make sense to him. So you tell him, whatever it is you are hearing, even if it doesn't make sense, begin to say it. It's as you say it that you become more energized. In 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4, Paul said, I will pray in the spirit. I will pray with my understanding also. That means the same way I pray willingly in my understanding. That's how I pray willingly in the spirit. The key word there is I will. It's not God will pray through me. It's I will pray in God. There are two different things. If they don't know this, they will never make up their mind to open their mouth to speak. And so as far as you hear those inspirations in your spirit, even the Holy Ghost will not open your mouth because God respects the will of man. If you don't submit your will to do it, it will never happen because until your will is submitted, it's not an act of faith. The reason many people never speak in tongues is because they never open their mouth to speak. They are waiting for God to open their mouth. It's not the Holy Ghost that is speaking in tongues. You are the one speaking in tongues. If you don't explain these things to them, you will baptize one person in the Holy Ghost 20 times. And you will keep baptizing, especially if you don't have discernment. You will get tired and say, ah, why is this person not being baptized? He's already baptized. He doesn't want to speak in tongues. So you teach him how to speak in tongues. Anytime he wants to, he will start. Because if he's waiting for God to open his mouth, it may never happen. Because they speak in tongues as God gave them utterance. I will pray in the spirit. I will pray in my understanding. That means if I will not, I will not. Until I will to, I will never do. Hope you know how a child begins to talk. Sometimes a child begins to talk is mama. Mama. Everything you say, mama. Everything means mama to the child. After a while, the vocabulary begins to increase. The vocabulary begins to increase. So God may give you one word. And you need to explain this to them. That God may give them one word. Some people are baptized in the Holy Ghost. All they hear is ka, ka, ka. You're saying it. As you are saying it, the energy becomes stronger. A point comes, as you say ka, it becomes kata, kapa, kapa. It is funny when you hear new converse. If you like, record their tongues. You will say, what is he saying? Because he's learning a new language. It's the God language. He's not yet an expert. But if you have spoken in tongues for six months, and you are somebody who really speaks in tongues, a point can come, you can even decide to add some flavors depending on where you are in the spirit realm. So if you are in a place where you are feeling the love of the Father, or you are feeling intimacy, you can decide to put some melody to it. Legro parahasta, falarondra aktavilo bragadide anza frohadikiras. You can be washing plate and be speaking in tongues. Kibaro on salavreste ef laharis kadahashti. And then, if you notice that there is threat around your environment and there is warfare, meila kaite, ibobo kakapai. Even the demon we know that this one coming is a wait. Zakado behira didi dadua kakato. When, because the kind of energy you are generating is different. There's energy for fellowship. When you are talking to a woman you love, will you say, where are you there? No. And I'm talking to my wife. I won't say it. Somebody wants to. <laughs> but your voice is smooth. Hello, baby. How are you doing? What's happening? Are you okay? 
And then your friend calls you the moment you drop the call. Hey, bro, how far? What did it happen? They are different energy. And there's somebody who wants to attack you, calls you. Are you okay? What are you talking about? It's a different operation. The same thing works in the spirit. When I'm coming for impartation, I will come and say, Legrofina, Margata, Villa, Grastove, Ligro. I, I have to ascend. I have to ascend. Zaka, Katova, Labahasta. Because I want to mobilize angels. Oh my God. You don't expect a young believer to do that. A young believer is only doing kabakabaka. Kabakabaka. But when it grows, vocabularies are added. Vocabularies. Vocabularies. But you have to speak in tongues to grow in the vocabulary. And then there are times when you pray in tongues until they transport you to realms where men don't talk. That's where God talks through you. That one is not you praying anymore. For you know not what to pray for as you ought to. But the Spirit Himself helped your infirmities with groanings that cannot be uttered. As you groan like that, after a while, warriors will enter the territory because they are ancient warriors. They will hear that sound. We know this sound. He said, when the trumpet makes an unusual sound, there are certain sounds that are not for mortals. That's why the Holy Ghost groans. Sometimes he wants to mobilize ancient warriors and he needs a man on earth to give permission. And so you have to speak the tongues that they spoke 100 years ago. And so the Holy Ghost will transport you. Nini ka 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 da 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 shnehe You are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are. Haroda, haya. Even you yourself, you'll be clothed. Because you have entered a battalion. And the battalion may be battalion of watchers. Vara vava kato, penesh, kalua, ezena kados. Raga tata. Oh my God. That's when you will hear. You don't know. Oh. oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. There are weapons in the spirit. I told them. See, there are times when you start praying like that. The Holy Ghost will not only seize your vocal cord. He will seize your legs. And then you find yourself in the room. Ka, ka, ka. Zeze, zeze. Zeze, zeze. Da, da, da. You are fighting. You are fighting. The Holy Ghost will take your hand. You can pick something up. You have uprooted the governor. That's war. That time you are not praying. It's God fighting through you. Jehovah Sabaoth has appeared. And he appeared through you that day. And so anybody who touches you that time, touches God. You want to pray for one minute? Come on, somebody climb somewhere. Climb somewhere, climb somewhere. Ila kato. Zoa, zoa, zoa. Bele le kula kato. Maro veke devana kato. 